The revolution is here. A movement of people free to live, work, and choose. We won't tell you what to think. We just demand that you think for yourself. This is Kibbe on Liberty. Okay, this is an unprecedented Massey Marathon. Um, I feel like the marketing on this is going to be excellent, but we just we just spent a good hour and a half um, collecting um, Massey receipts for all of the times you were right and the uh, lockdown COVID machine was wrong. Um, but afterwards, we started talking about about Ukraine and and the Biden administration saber rattling, rattle, rab, rattling, and. Um, specifically, this guy, um, an AP reporter named Matt Lee, was asking hard questions. Let's see, what was that? A State Department briefing or a yeah. DoD? I don't remember. Yep, State Department. Yeah, and and I wanted to get your take on on Ukraine and the Biden administration's stance and the, the stories about about false flags and like what's going on. Whoa. Um, it's like they watched a movie. And by the way, in two years, we'll we'll come back and collect the receipts on yes. this. Yes. It's like the Biden administration. They watched some movies about diplomacy, and they came up with this plan that if they're worried about a false flag, they should, they should go out in the media and say, oh, we've got evidence of a false flag about to happen so that they can forestall a false flag happening, but they don't really have any evidence. And it all works in the movie. Because the reporter never bothers to question what the actual evidence is. Yeah. And this reporter, Matt Lee, said, okay, you said that, but how do we know that? And, and the spokesperson said, because I said it. That's how you know it. And they go on for like 15 minutes back and forth that way. And it's, it's beautiful because it's what journalism should be. Uh, and he may be the last journalist alive. <laughs> he could be. A dying breed. And, and he won't be invited to the next press conference yeah. or, or called on if he is there. Um, but, you know, God bless him for doing journalism. By the way, we received a briefing from SecDef and DNI and Secretary of State, you know, congressional briefing. And they sold us the same exact thing without producing any evidence in that briefing. They assembled, you know ostensibly 435 members of the House of Representatives, although s some weren't there. I go to see what's in the New York Times and on Facebook already. Like, these aren't really classified briefings. One of my colleagues brought her purse in with her phone in it, and her phone started ringing. <laughs> and, you know, nobody's supposed to have a phone in here. We're all looking at her like she's trying to pretend it's not her purse that's ringing. So, anyways, I don't blame them for not giving us the real stuff in there. But it, th these really are propaganda exchanges. This is a chance for the administration to lobby Congress. It's not that they're giving us any secret sauce. Yeah. And, and then they went to the regular media and tried to spin the same thing. Thankfully, this, uh, this reporter was a little more skeptical than most members of Congress. Um, here's, you know, I had sort of an epiphany or a re-epiphany when thinking this through in the Ukraine, I'm, <clears throat> I want to state right off, I'm opposed to our intervention in Ukraine. We should uh, not get in a game of chicken with another nuclear power. We should not be, it's not even a proxy war. It would be a hot war if we got involved. We should not be there in that capacity, but we should also not engage in an economic war with them. The, the Europeans who have more trade than us have evaluated and decided it's not in their best interests. And so I'd like to talk about both of those, but it, I want to first think about what a conflict looks like and what Putin's calculus is as to whether to take Ukraine or parts of it. In a, the military, obviously, the Russian military, even though it's a vestige of the Soviet empire, it's still much stronger than uh, Ukraine's military. That battle... I mean, what do you guess? How long would that take to, for the Russians to s establish, let's say, air superiority over Ukraine? Like ex anywhere from four hours to— Yeah, a day, to, a, a yeah. week at most. Yeah, four hours to two weeks, yeah. I think. Um, depending on how, if the military—like, how long was it in Afghanistan? It wasn't even four hours. It was already so, sort of pre-decided they were going to put down their— their guns that we had given them. 
the Afghan national forces. So that's not the real battle. That doesn't come into Putin's calculus. He knows he wins that in a, in a matter of days. Uh, what the real conflict looks like is, are there Russian soldiers who have a wife and children at home, uh, you know, five more years on their comfortable retirement back in Russia, are they going to stroll down the streets of Kiev knowing that somebody in an apartment could put a bullet in their head? Like, you can keep your country, you can keep your house, uh, only if at the end of the day you're willing, and I know this sounds radical and I hope you don't get canceled for this, only if at the end of the day a certain number of you are willing to shoot somebody to keep it. Whether that's an invading army or a, a, a dictatorship of your own government, until you are willing, and I don't want to glamorize the Chechens, but, you know, they had a little run in there, Chechnya. Until you're willing to, like, in your uh, pajamas or jogging uniform, not in a military uniform, right, walk out of your house with a firearm and shoot a soldier, uh, either of, of your own autocratic dictatorship or of another government, it's not really yours. You don't get to keep it. And we can't, here's the converse to that. If the Ukrainians, not the soldiers who are paid, but if the Ukrainians themselves are not willing to, sh to shoot an invading force, we can't help them. We saw that in Afghanistan. So what do you, um, and you, you've dis you're, you're basically describing a specific take on, on Russia versus Ukraine that is pretty much the frame that you've used to oppose every single war, including the next one we don't even know about. You're right, I'm against the next war already. Yeah, but what's, what's talk, talk, talk a little bit about, and, and you probably got some of this from, from Ron Paul and, and um, other similar sources, but, but what, is your, what is your framework um, constitutionally, and, and how, do you, how do you defend what amounts to a, a skepticism of, of foreign intervention, if, if not straight up non-interventionist? Okay, my ideology was developed in Sunday school when I was a kid. It's called the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Uh, we have no more right to be in the sovereign country of Syria than they have an established government, um, than they have to be in Florida, just from a basic human rights perspective, sovereign countries. And it'll get me, it may get me in trouble for saying that, but it's the golden rule. That's, that's Ron Paul's philosophy. That's mine. It's the only one that will work in the long term. If you try to be an empire and subjugate cultures and countries that don't want to be a part of your country or part of your ideology, they'll eventually resent you for it, not just the governments, but the people. And then you get terrorism. You, you have entire religions that are built on hating America and um uh, you're inviting that when you go try to subjugate people who aren't your people. Uh, so, and it's also like, that's just the first layer. Right. The second layer is we can't afford it. This, none of this would be possible without printing money and going in debt. If you, if you tabulate the stuff we account uh, in the Middle East, in Iraq and Afghanistan, it's about, you know, probably $4 trillion. But what about the trailing health care and retirement uh, for the people that served over there? It's a lot bigger than that. Yeah. It's, a, it's a very large portion of our national debt. So, number one, it's not moral. Uh, number two, it will work against you eventually. People will resent you. Number three, we can't afford it. Number four, which m maybe should have been my first point, our men and women should not die for things that aren't in America's interests. Yeah, maybe it's a, a fetish of the State Department and has been for 30 years, uh, or somebody that recently got elected and they're, oh, they need a distraction, they need to flex their muscles, uh, the executive always looks stronger when they're, uh, you know, uh, leading a war, yeah. even our founding fathers knew this, that's why they gave the authority to Congress. Um, so we shouldn't we shouldn't put our uh, men and women's lives at risk over there for these things. 
And then finally, gosh, I've got a whole list of <laughs> why we shouldn't be in Afghanistan or or Ukraine. Uh, Congress has to vote on this. Like our, our founding fathers said, the executive gets to wear the laurels uh, when they win a war or, or conquer somebody. And um, they're the most prone to, to getting into war. And so they vested with Congress the authority and the responsibility to decide when and where we go to war. So one, uh, and maybe this is um, sort of assumed and you know, we can't afford it, but one of the takeaways I hoped would come out of the fiasco of not just 20 years in Afghanistan, but the withdrawal f- from Afghanistan is that um, war in particular, particularly sort of nation building permanent occupation type wars, which apparently is, is what the United States does now. Um, it's a form of central planning where you come in with very little knowledge about this, this foreign place, the, the culture, the people, the economy, um, and a million other things that you just don't know. And you try to reorganize it. We're going to create a, a Western democracy in Afghanistan. Um, you know, all of these tragic or comical attempts to, to, to build um, new industries and all that stuff. And I know you've talked about this, but to, to me, it's like a, there's, there's a cautionary tale about, you know what, central planning doesn't work. And, and anyone, anyone at the State <laughs> Department that tells right. you it does, uh, look, look at the exit strategy in Afghanistan. It was clownishly bad. It doesn't work here. So yeah, why would we think anywhere. it's going to work overseas? We built a hydroelectric dam in Afghanistan and then gave the Taliban a third of the electricity in exchange for them not blowing it up. Then we improved their roads and irrigation and they doubled drug production. Even though we spent $8 billion to eradicate their drug industry and we drove the Taliban who initially were anti-drug, was uh, antithetical to their religion, yeah. um, to be the, the purveyors of, you know, poppy and heroin. <laughs> so, yeah, you have unintended consequences. And, and while we're on central planning or economics, I, w- I want to talk about the folly of getting into an economic war with Russia. Okay, Russia's economy is smaller than South Korea's economy. It's so- smaller than Italy's economy. And it's actually not even an economy where they produce a lot of finished product. They, their exports are oil, like raw, some of it refined, uh, gas. To the United States, we, we buy a lot of that stuff from them, um, even though we, we could be energy independent. Uh, there may be some things where it's economically beneficial to get that, but they give us raw materials. We buy raw materials from them. We turn them into manufactured products. So it's not like a competition with China where they're buying raw materials from us, like wood, and then turning those into products. For instance, let me just, I went and looked at our imports from Russia. Uh, we imported a couple years ago, the number was $700 million of fertilizer from Russia. Now, if you think food's expensive now, uh, wait until you see at the end of this summer, because fertilizer, the price of it's more than doubled. And you take just a small percentage of that off the market. And by the way, this is like potash, stuff that you mine, not stuff that you can make in a factory. Uh, Take a small percentage of that off the market and you're going to see food prices go through the roof again. So it's not only is a hot war with another nuclear power foolish on its face, but an economic war of sanctions. I've, I've never voted, and this sometimes gets me in trouble, I've never voted for a sanction on, an, on another sovereign country. Maybe sanctioned terrorists, yes. <laughs> but a sovereign established country I th- that has exports and imports and we're trading with, I think it's foolish uh, because there are lots of reasons. But one is it's going to hurt our consumers. But number two, it's going to turn the people in that country against you. It's going to, it almost always hurts them more than the people in power. Yeah, it's like... Um I think supposedly it was Frederick Bastiat that said when goods don't cross borders, troops will. Um, there's a lot of truth in that. Sorry, I just quoted another dead economist, a, yeah. a French one, no less. At least but. you didn't quote Voltaire. <laughs> That's an Easter egg for some other people. Yeah. Um, so 
So let, let's get back to the constitutional question um, uh, where Congress needs to um, vote on acts, acts of war because the executive branch, as James Madison said, you know, that those guys like to start fights because mm -hmm. they, you know, macho and cool. Um, Biden, um, as I understand it, Biden has sent troops to Europe. Is that constitutional? I think it is. I think he has the authority to move troops around. Uh, we could shut down those bases. We could defund if there are bases, for instance. We could reduce the number of troops available to him. We could, but Congress isn't, you know, our authority is to declare war, but not to campaign the, you know, lead the campaign of war. You do at some point let to have the, must let the commander in chief have the authority of where to move those troops. I think it's foolish. Yeah. If, it, if there were a vote in Congress, I would vote against it. I think we're jabbing and have been jabbing Russia in the eye by expanding NATO. Uh, you know, it'd be like they're trying to have more presence in Cuba or Central and South America um, or Canada. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe Canada is a better, you know, more appropriate. I mean, they feel threatened and politically at home. By the way, I think we should build a wall between us and Canada, um, at least until Justin Trudeau is thrown out of office. But that's a sidebar. Uh, but, but let the truckers across first. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd love to trade uh, um, our truckers, um, their truckers for our college kids. I think that would be a cool trade. <laughs> one, one, uh, while we're talking about slogans and messages, one thing that's re that has resonated that I've said is we the people in Washington D.C. care more about the border between Russia and Ukraine than they do w about our own borders and our southern border, which is true. And I I think some of what Joe Biden is doing in the in Ukraine is to distract from his other domestic issues. So there's a um, and I want to I want to um, ask you a question that I get asked a lot, and and Terry and I spent a lot of time in Europe and particularly Eastern Europe and former Soviet satellite countries like like Georgia. Uh, we've spoken in Ukraine a number of times. Uh, we have friends in Estonia and, and Lithuania, um, Latvia, and um, they don't like Putin. They feel existentially threatened by um, this, um, by his thuggish ways and, and Putin actually went into Georgia a couple years ago, um, and and my reaction to them and 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 you know these are these are libertarians who who rightfully point out that that Putin's not a good guy. He's not a, hardly a, a Democrat that believes in in the civil liberties of his people. And the best, as a non-interventionist myself, the best answer I can give them is you got to get your own country right because the only thing that protects you from a thug like Vladimir Putin is having the economic strength and independence to ignore him because the, particularly energy is the, is the weapon he uses against those countries. Um, what do you tell them? Because you know there are good people in all these countries yeah. fighting for liberty just like we do here. Well, first of all, if you don't have a second amendment in your constitution, you need to get that. Yeah. Um, and this gets to one of my earlier points. And, and Putin is not concerned about the air war with Ukraine. He's in his calculus. It's can he sustain two years of his soldiers being shot in the head, uh, you know, at random by snipers, you know, and it wouldn't take all of Ukraine to stand up. But some of them have to have firearms and it's got to be legal. Yeah. They can't just, you know, start getting them. By the, by the way, that's easy. that's ultimately why George Washington won was because the British people got tired of this endless war in the colonies, and they're like, what are we doing? Yeah, who who wants to come over here and yeah. fight with these crazy, rednecks and hillbillies? Crazy, you know, well-armed rednecks. I guess these weren't terms of derision then, but they're terms of endearment to me. Yeah. But who, who you know, what general or even enlisted person who has a comfortable life at home? So uh, I would agree with you. Your own country has to be in line. You have to be economically... Uh, no country can be completely independent trade-wise and optimize, you know, their economy. You have to have trade. Uh, but 
you know, a, a functioning economy, but also a bill of rights. Wait, what are you fighting for? A different dictator? Like, that's the way I feel about in this country sometimes. Like, people are complaining about communists who may invade uh, Ukraine, but what the hell have they been doing to our country? When you can tell people they can't go to church, they can't go to work, their kids have to wear these muzzles. Uh, By the way, this is Biden. They're probably going to airdrop people yeah. to stop I, this conversation. I, I hear a helicopter. <laughs> yes. I doubt it's a black helicopter. Probably, probably Marine One. Yeah. Um, that's, yeah, like, um, I mean, that's that's a good that's a good point as well that um, I, and this is where like, I'm, I'm not sort of, I guess we call them national conservatives now. And, and one thing they get right is skepticism about never ending wars, but um, they also want to use the power that we've accrued here in Washington, DC to help their guys. And I, I think that's, that's, that's just another flavor of the same thing. I forget who it was. Some, some never Trumper neocon guy um, actually came out and said, you know, we need a conservative collectivism. He used the word collectivism. I'm like, no, dude, that's that's just uh, putting lipstick on a pig. It's the same thing. It's the same thing, and it'll all be the same thing. I, I think you have to get the hearts and minds of 10 to 20 percent of your population. Just going back to the analogy with throwing off the British f- from what became the United States. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't everybody, but there were, you know, there was an irate minority, right, uh, who didn't want to be repressed. Yeah, John Adams estimated it was like a third of the colonial public was was liberty. That's what will deter Putin from Ukraine. If if he determines there that twenty percent of them constitute an irate minority that is armed, and says, you know, I'd rather die than to live under uh, a different. A dictator or a dictator at all, um, then that stops him. I think that's the calculus he's making yeah. right yeah. now. Uh, so that would be my advice to any of the other countries. Don't rely on us to subsidize whatever government or culture you have right now. So, so final question. Um, does um, It sure seems like the Biden administration, and this is sort of wag the dog kind of conspiracy theories that unfortunately is probably true. Like they seem to really want a hot war. They, they seem to want to get into a fight um, to change the subject from the fact that they've wrecked the economy, that they've done all of these things that we talked about in the last episode, um, uh, destroying uh, the working class in this country. Um, does it seem like they're, they're pushing hard? Like, do you, th- do you think their motives are good and maybe you don't even want to answer this, but why are they pushing so hard? What's going on? Obviously, a distraction is in their interest. Yeah. Uh, you know, every day that this is in the news, something else isn't in the news. And so they want to get the other stuff out of the news. I would be hopeful that the president who just got us out of Afghanistan in a clumsy, clown-like, fatal way uh, – would at least not want to get us in another war. You can say a lot of things about Trump, but in one of my phone conversations with him, I thanked him for not getting us in another war. Yeah, And, and um, he was glad that I acknowledged that. And I think it would be really bad for Biden's legacy to get us in another war. They can entertain and talk about these things. The problem with rattling sabers and passing resolutions in Congress is you increase the, the temperature and this is why I vote against the saber rattling. Like, I guarantee you there's going to be some resolution, if not sanctions. We've already, probably the president has some authority already granted to him to do sanctions through some channel that Congress has already given him, and he'll declare an emergency and do that. But we may have a vote on sanctions in Congress, and we may have a vote on some saber rattling, and it'll be a bunch of whereas clauses, and now therefore be it resolved. And that clause really doesn't do much of anything. And I, I will tell you, I'm almost certain to vote against that stuff because it, r- it raises the temperature of things there. Yeah. Um, one, one thing that I did want to mention, uh, some of your viewers may have seen my Christmas picture <laughs> uh, where my family are holding the implements of protecting, you know, your country. Uh, 
Yeah. And um, if there were enough Ukrainians with Christmas pictures like that, I think Putin would say, we're not going there. And so, the, the, again, to my point. By, by the way, I was literally triggered looking at your picture. <laughs> a lot of people were triggered. The Archbishop of Canterbury had to, felt compelled to weigh in. Oh, but I the, didn't know that. Yeah, the head of the Church of England condemned my tweet. <laughs> I mean, this is a dumpster fire. Why yeah. is somebody who's at the top of a church uh, consumed with some picture in a dumpster fire? Uh, but that tweet reached 108 million people on Twitter before yeah. it made it to the evening news and all and Reddit and everywhere else. But, you know, if I were the Ukrainians, I'd be sending out some Christmas pictures like that to Putin. Yeah. <laughs> a, 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 a final um, footnote to that. Um, you probably saw some some big uh, Chinese government official um, was mocking the Second Amendment and the fact that, that Americans shoot each other. And I, I thought um, my reaction was, well, I understand the Chinese government wants a monopoly because they like to shoot their people. And they, they literally do that, so to your point. Like, authoritarians don't want people to have guns. Um, I get the most amusement when people from Britain condemn my pro second amendment stances like they have short-term memories and don't <laughs> don't remember that we we threw them out of here because we had firearms it was a while ago it, it was a while ago had to even relitigate that again <laughs> and um now they're our best allies but it wouldn't have turned out this way if we didn't have firearms so yeah you expect it from china but i'm always surprised when the brits condemn our individual right to self-defense having been on the receiving end of it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll leave it there. And thanks for doing this um, uh, ad hoc conversation about Ukraine. We'll see where we are next week. I, uh, I think we're going to be right uh, over the next decade yeah. about all of these things, regardless of what happens next week. It should be a regular cycle where we just um, – gather every two years to go back two years and say, you know, we told you so. Uh, change, change the podcast in two years, too. I told you so with Matt Kitty. <laughs> okay. Thank you, sir. Thanks.